see where everything else falls into better perspective and put the whole concept together. So what we had mentioned earlier uh, in starting the process was that we said that matter is anything that occupies space. That's what natural scientists who are the scientists that explore the physical dimensions of life. And so in exploring the physical dimensions of life, what scientists decided to do was to um, look all around us um, in the physical component of our life and anything that is occupying space all around us, they are going to call it matter. And so in looking at the components of matter, scientists said that they are going to name um, the components of matter elements. And they've discovered a lot of elements which they've put on what they call the periodic table. They intend to realize that elements are composed of atoms. Atoms, again, have these subparticles, protons, which they are positively charged particles. We have neutrons that have no charge. And then we have electrons that are negatively charged particles. We also have sub-subparticles up up, um, um, the quarks and, and other um, subparticles in that sense. So basically, they realize that atoms tend to interact between and among themselves by means of their electrons, which are these um, particles that um, houses specific energy levels around the, the, the nucleus of the atom, which is housing the protons and the neutrons. And these electrons hover um, in specific orbits or shells or, or energy levels. These are energy levels, clouds, energy level clouds, or sometimes we call them orbits, or sometimes we call them shells. And the position of the electrons determine how much energy it has um, are, are, um, in, in, in relation to its position to, to the nucleus. And so the farther away an electron is away from uh, the nucleus, um, of atoms, the more energy it, 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 will, it will house. And if an, an electron falls back towards a position, towards a, a nuclear area, it will have to release the electrons to, to house um, clouds or energy levels closer to the nuclear areas. So um, in atoms interacting with each other to form different molecules, they form molecules and each atom um, within the molecule uh, are having um, I have separate or specific positions and orientation that is determined by the positions of their electrons and hence it determines the amount of energy within that uh, molecule. All right, so you are going to, uh, actually you already did that in Bio 1 when you were looking at metabolic processes, glycolysis for example, where there were rearrangement of electrons and depending on the, sorry, rearrangement of, of atoms within molecules to form other molecular types and depending on the, if you look closely at the biochemistry um, structure of these molecules that are changing to form other forms like 2-phosphoglyceric um, acid forming, 2-phosphor-1 um, or vice versa, the, the, the atoms within the molecules are positioned differently and therefore their electrons will be positioned differently and therefore they would have different amounts of energy housing those molecules and therefore when there is that change from one form to another it causes the release of energy if the, the change is going to produce molecules that the electrons are positioned at lower energy levels. All right? And then that's when it brings about the coupling formation, um, the, the formation of ATP, which serves as a coupler of energy for biochemical reactions, all right? So having said that, all these atomic uh, interaction and processes um, that electrons are involved in among themselves bring about the formation of um, molecules. Um, in, for, for, since this is a biology course, there are two types of molecules, um, and because we are trying to look at how the component, molecular components are coming together to form molecular structures, which we refer to as cellular structures um, um, in terms of biology, which is the study of living systems. And the cells serve as the basic unit of life. So we are trying to look at molecules that bring about the formation of cellular structures. So the, the two types of molecules that we said we had was organic molecules and inorganic molecules. The organic molecules pertaining to life, we have water and several mineral types, minerals. And then for for the organic one, we said we have vitamins, 
and these molecules that we refer to as biological molecules. And these biological molecules, um, which of course are organic molecules, and we have carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have lipids, and then we have nucleic nucleic acids, nuclear components. So in any case, all these molecules that I've mentioned right now, okay, um, are serving two main purposes. Um, so again, we are trying to look at living systems. So we are trying to look at life, biology, which is the study of life. And the basic, at this point, we are saying that the basic unit of life is the cell, but this understanding is going to change um, soon because of the presence of um, the viral and, and prion particles that are non-cellular particles that have living um, characteristics. So, but just for the purposes of what we are saying, um, these molecules are serving two purposes. One, they are serving as energy, these raw materials or these molecules are serving as energy sources, okay, for the cell to use for its chemical reaction processes, which we refer to as metabolic processes. All these raw materials are serving as the building blocks that come together to form the cell. Okay, so the cell can presume it, um, in forming living systems, the, the, the cell can form unicellular organisms, all right, or it can form multicellular um, entities, all right. Um, so then, but there, there are two types of cells that scientists have um, discovered so far on our planet Earth, which is the prokaryotic cell, okay, the prokaryotic cell, and then the eukaryotic cell. These molecules serving as uh, energy sources or as golden blocks. Basically, we have, we need energy, okay, and then we need um, building block. In terms of energy, all right, we have organisms that get energy directly from the sunlight, and then we have those that get the energy by uh, relying on organic molecule components. So we call them chemo organo. That's how they get their energy. And then we have those that get their energy from inorganic um, um, chemicals. So we call them chemolethal. So what about um, the, the building block? Um, well, some of them are able to use um, elements and simple molecules. So like most plants are able to use elements in the soil and and um, simple molecules like carbon dioxide and put them together to, um, with the help of the energy that they've acquired from sunlight to form other molecular forms that they use to build their cellular structures as plants, okay, more complex cellular structures as plants. So for such um, organisms that are able to use the elements of the earth and simple molecules, small simple molecules like carbon dioxide and whatnot um, are referred to as autotrophs, so autotrophs, all right? But we have some that have to rely on other molecules, energy, um, as they are building blocks. They cannot put simple molecules together, so they have to rely on other complex molecular forms to, to get to use as their raw materials, okay? So, of course, they digest them. They are in complex forms, so they have digestive enzymes that break them into smaller components within their cells, and then their DNA, their nucleic acid material, will determine how they recombine to form the different cellular structures that is needed in, in that in that molecular or cellular structure or, or of the living system. So, with that, um, such organisms may still utilize um, sunlight as their source of energy, but they would now be heterotrophs if they require um, other complex or organic molecules as their source of building blocks, but then they digest it to f smaller components and use it um, within their cells as dictated by their nucleic acid genetic material. Um, the same thing applies to the chemo-organo ones. We may have the autotroph ones, so chemo-organo autotrophs that can actually put simple molecules and elements together for their own 
um, to build their, their cellular structural forms, or they may have to rely on other um, complex molecules and digest them into simpler molecules to use as the raw materials for their building blocks. The same thing applies to the chemolithotrophs as well. They could, we could have the autotroph forms, um, and then we can have the heterotrophs, all right? Heterotrophs. Okay, so this is how cellular structures are utilizing these molecules as energy sources or as building blocks. Okay, so now that we've um, now that we've come to this, the next thing is that we are now going to look at how these pro organisms that are prokaryotic and organisms that are eukaryotic. We are going to look at how scientists have divided them into the separate domains. The first step that they use is their nucleic acid. Okay, so do you see this nucleic acid as a biological molecule right here? Okay, it serves as the main molecule that drives life. Um, it serves as a genetic material that drives life. It's so important. Like I always say, it's a nucleic acid world. You, you've heard me say this before. They, each species is just a molecular structure that the nucleic acid chromosome, which is part of chromosomes, um, so chromosome acids are particles of nucleic acid, and they are determining the type of house or molecular structure that they want to live in, and, and, and they are just there um, giving instructions to the kind of building they build, which is you, your anatomy, uh, your anatomical structure for their survival, and so and and so this, the different um, alloys that are recombining and combining is creating separate uh, chromosomal sets that are giving instructions to to produce the different species that we see, and there are different um, processes that throw light into how this um, differences are being seen in connection to diversity on, on life. And that actually connects to the story of what evolution is saying in, in bringing about the separate um, diversity that we see with life and yet there are similarities because we are all sharing the same genetic code via the, this important strong particle called the nucleic acid particle. For prokaryotic organisms, they were placed in, um, in, in two domains, bacteria and archaea. And then for eukaryotic cells, they were placed in the domain eukarya. All right? What is happening with all this classification? What scientists are looking into doing is to see how Again, let's establish this, that nucleic acids, all right, the nucleic acids are very important in serving as the blueprint, okay, nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are very important and they serve as the blueprint having the instruction to determine what molecular structures should be formed to house the DNA to house a genetic material, which could be DNA or RNA, depending on the organism. Okay, by, or, or depending on the molecular structure, like viruses, which are, which could be RNA, um, as, which, which they could have, which could have RNA as their genetic material. So having said that, um, I want us to look at this from a different perspective, all right? So you, you are having nucleic acids, um, form what we call chromosomes. And and so cro different chromosomal sets give instruction to 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 these molecules to come together to form these uh, molecular structures that we call organisms. Alright? So uh, for us humans we have 23 pairs of chromosomes um, that are given instructions to form the molecular structure that we see as humans. Dogs have their chromosomal sets. Drosophila have two sets of chromosomes, which is uh, two pairs. 
of chromosomes which makes it a total of um, four chromosomes that determine their molecular structure. You are going to see that even in bio one you did this, that when you look at um, the bulk of, of, of um, nucleic acid in, in, or the genetic material in our nucleus, all right, um, they, most of the nucleic acid are there to, to regulate genetic expression. So the, the amount of DNA that are, that are serving as genes that get expressed for us to see the phenotypic characteristics that we call this organism human, we call that organism chimpanzee, we call this organism plant, this organism mushrooms and whatnot. These, um, most of the DNA within, within the fabric of organisms are playing regulatory roles more than expressive roles or or, or genotypic roles that bring about um, um, gene expression um, in terms of phenotypic characteristics that we see. Now, this understanding is important because when we are talking about relationship between and among living organisms, and we are saying we start off by looking at the similarities between their DNA uh, or, or genes or, or, or genetic material, all right? Now, I'm going to be using DNA because so far with cellular structures, DNA is serving as a template, the genetic material that gives instruction to how the molecular structure of organisms should look like. Uh, um, again, I've mentioned that we have viruses, that their genetic material is RNA. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to just be using DNA solely as a genetic material, which that may change if we discover cellular structures that use RNA as a genetic material. Who knows? But for the purposes of what we are discussing, I'm just, I will just be interchangeably using um, the genetic material that determines who we are. I'll be interchanging it with the, the term DNA, all right? And so far, DNA is, is, is the genetic material outside of um, viruses, some viruses, not all viruses um, have RNA. We have RNA viruses and we have DNA viruses. So anyway, back to this understanding. I, I want you to know that um, um, these chromosomal sets are obviously composed of, of DNA, correct? And when we look at cellular structures that we, we've seen so far. And majority of, of the DNA, as I have mentioned, are serving regulatory purposes and, and functions. Now, I'm stressing this point because when we compare different species and we are looking at the relationship among species, you are going to see that we will see a lot of um, DNA um, sequence similarities, all right, DNA similarities across uh, different species. For example, when we look at, um, I believe, chimpanzees and humans, um, roughly 90%, if not a little bit more, of our DNA is the same. So yeah, of course, we all are, we all are, all living systems are, are operating by means of the blueprint nucleic acid, and we, we follow the same genetic code. In other words, if um, there is a, a genetic code that brings about the formation of uh, a messenger RNA, AUG, which will represent an amino acid methionine, that does not change from species to species. It's universal across all living systems. So yes, we are all being made from the same Play-Doh, um, so to speak, all right? So um, back to what I'm saying, um, sometimes this alarming similarities that we see across species, across organisms, may socially create like, hmm, how come we look so different? When, when we are genetically so similar. Well, you, you want to just look at yourself, all right? You are a multicellular organism. You are made up of a lot of different cells, okay? You are made up of a lot of cells, all right? Let me say that. You are made up of a lot of cells. But you originated from just one cell. But then, what is happening? As a molecule, as a multicellular organism right now, if you look at the separate cells that you have as a multicellular structure, the, the cells look different from each other, all right? Your hair cell is certainly looks different and, and plays a separate function from your, your muscle cell, okay, or your tongue cell, all right? 
But mind you, you have to remember that the DNA in your hair cell, okay, the chromosome assets in your hair cell, for the most part, is exactly the same in your muscle cell, all right? So if the DNA sequences, every single thing is the same, because you, remember you came from one zygote, one cell, your mother's egg, and then your dad's chromosoma set in the sperm and your mom's chromosoma set, 23 chromosomes of your dad's sperm and 23 chromosomes of your mom's sperm came together to form the zygote and, and, the, and then your cells divided and differentiated to form the embryo and to form the fetus and to form you, the newborn baby neonate and you as an adult. Um, the cells for the most part, if mutations have not arisen to allow, I mean, like, I'm, again, I'm saying this because some some individuals, like individuals that we, we, we've documented that you have Down syndrome, sometimes it's not every single cell that um, you see, you see they have um, the trisomy in those cells. And so I'm, I'm just trying to qualify that part. That's why I'm using the word for the most part. But other than um, if, if your development, if there were no mistakes in, 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 in development, okay, um, in terms of meiotic mistakes, non-disjunction or whatnot, basically every single cell in your body would have exactly the same chromosoma sex. But how come when you take your tongue cell and you take your muscle cell, Oh, and all oh, your skin cell for that matter, they all look different and they contain the same exact DNA. Well, because the regulatory um, aspect in place is different from one cell to another. So although you have the same DNA in your hair cell and your muscle cell, the instructions that is being given to those two cells are separate instructions. And, 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 and so it's causing the, the molecular structures or the anatomical features of these two cells to be opposite, including even their functions to be totally different, all right? Not opposite, but totally different, okay? So you can see how the, the, the set of, of DNA that gives the instruction to, 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 to build these molecular components of a cell is basically what determines how your characteristics both anatomically and, and physiologically functionally should look like. And so the, this throws importance to, to the role of DNA in serving regulatory purposes. Um, one cell, like the hair cell, the regulatory instruction in there is like make hair, all right? Now it doesn't so that DNA that makes hair is making the hair cell based on other characteristics that has allowed this to happen. Whilst in the muscle cell, um, the DNA that makes the hair cell has been downregulated in the muscle cell not to make the not not to make the hair structure, all right? So it's making other things to make the cell, the muscle cell and uh, different sets of DNA within this muscle cell is, is giving the instructions to make the cell a muscle cell. Now, with this understanding, you can clearly now understand why viral particles, when they invade cellular structures, the, the, the nucleic acid particle can now assume authority over everything else if it's the most powerful regulatory gangster. That's what I call them. I call them gangsters. So this viral particle gangster of nucleic acid material will invade your cell and tell all those other regulatory um, DNAs that you do what I tell you to do. And so whatever you, you, have, you were originally doing in this skin cell or hair cell or muscle cell, stop and do what I tell you to do. And so it depends on the power of that nucleic acid um, segment that that tells the cell what you should do all right so i wanted us to just view this from a, a, a nucleic acid perspective so having said that it actually makes sense that in 
in looking at the evolutionary history of organisms and trying to put together the relationship among organisms, looking at their alleles, their chromosomes, the, for the most part the chromosomal sets uh, is, is the way forward to understand the similarities that exist. All right, that's where we have to start from. Before we go to 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 embryo, embryological studies and morphology, if you if we look at morphology straight away, will be will be grossly mistaken. All right, because if you take for example your skin cell, okay, some of you have done cheek cell staining, you look at your, your, your cheek cell and you take a muscle cell, okay, from, from your body and you compare it with an amoeba cell, you would assume, and let's say these are unicellular organisms, okay, you would assume that your cheek cell is more related to the amoeba cell because of the way they look outwardly, but no, your cheek cell is more related to your muscle cell because they actually have the exact same chromosomal sets in DNA. So you're going to, uh, when we talk about evolution and evolutionary process and evolutionary history in, in putting together phylo, and understanding phylogenicity and putting together the phylogenetic tree, we always start with the nucleic acid because the, the, the cell may look different from each other or the organisms may look different from each other, that they are exactly more closely related than others, all right? And so then at this point, I'm just going to go back to looking at the cell. Uh, we have the eukaryotic cell, prokaryotic cell. For prokaryotic cell, we have bacteria and, and archaea as the two domains. And we have um, organisms that are composed of the eukaryotic cell. We have the eukarya as... as um, so in eukarya, the same thing, they use the alleles, um, DNA, and then they use embryology to, to divide it into what we call the unicontest. And then let me put by contest, all right? And then again, through several studies and, and, and molecular um, studies and other embryology, embryological studies, the unicontests were divided into the amoeba zoovers, not a lot of this, opistocontests. And then the opistocontests, we have the coanoflagellates, we have fungi, and then we have animalia. And then the bi contest, okay, we have the plantae, we have the alveolates, we have the rhizarians, we have the excavators. And then we have the straminophils. And then the plantae, we have land plants. And then we have algae. And the algae, we have glaucophyta. We have the red algae, and then we have um, this. This is more like a taxonomic approach. But now I want to connect all this information that we've just talked about to these concepts. These concepts, and what are these concepts? What concepts am I referring to? I'm referring to. Evolution. I'm referring to evolutionary process and then phylogenicity together with the phylogenetic tree or what we call the tree of life and then what is evolution as we already discussed populations 
evolve while individuals modify with descent. But the way I'm going to actually approach this is to start from speciation. So I'm going to go backwards, all right? I'm going to start from speciation. So based on what I just said, pertaining to the fact that we are having DNA, um, these gangsters that are forming, I'm calling DNA gangsters, <laughs> that are forming these separate chromosomal sets, right? That are group of gangsters, I'm calling the, the chromosomal sets, group of gangsters that are detecting the molecules um, that they, they employ to form these anatomic structures that we call organisms, right? So we are having separate chromosomal sets that are producing separate species, all right? So phylogenicity is looking at evolutionary history um, of organisms, and we are putting together the phylogenetic tree to see how these organisms are related to one another. Okay, so the phylogenetic tree places the, the, the closeness and, and how organisms are distantly related or closely related and it employs um, looking at one. The first thing they look first is the nucleic acid or as we say the molecular and biochemistry of, of the organism. Okay, and then so in, in, in the example that I gave your chick cell will be, if it's a unicellular organism, will be more closely related to your muscle cell uh, if, they are, if your muscle cell is a unicellular organism and because the DNA is exactly the same in comparison to an amoeba cell, all right? So they start off with the nucleic acid, okay? And then they move on to the embryology, the developmental process, um, or they call the development aspect before they look at morphological structures that that they determine. And so because morphology, you can't determine which particular trait or structure you're going to make a priority. Are you going to choose skin color as the as a criteria to, to show how related organisms are when it comes to morphology? Or you are going to use you are going to use height. Alright? What what so then which one becomes a priority over the other, all right? So when it comes to morphology, it, it, it's actually, um, it causes different phylogenetic tree to, 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 to be employed. Um, and so there's no one specific one that is fully, um, like this is, this is it in that sense. But they have, because we've already compared the molecular phase of it and we've already compared the, um, embryology or developmental phase of it, what, most of it are actually already closely related in, within the phylogenetic tree or they are relatively at their correct positions um, and the only slight criteria that may bring variation from one phylogenetic tree to the other may be more of the morphological um, choice that we are using to determine how closely related they are with each other. Um, so that's the, the, the sequence of what is being used in, in, in these species um, based, and we have these different species based on their allelic combinations with, with, with other allels in, in producing the different types of organisms that we see. And then we using, a, a, using these processes to determine the phylogenicity and, and the phylogenetic tree. And so then what happens? Well, as species, when you're looking at a specific species, um, um, we, we have a term we, we refer to as populations, all right, population. The definition of a population is a group of, um, a group of, of, of individuals that belong to the same species that are living in the same area that may interbreed with one another. That is the definition of a population. So when you have a population that is a group of individuals of the same species living in, 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 in the same area, what we call evolutionary processes can happen to this population. And these evolutionary processes that happen to the population 
can bring about evolution. So in evolution, what happens is that individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. So what are these evolutionary processes that can impact populations for evolution to work here? These evolutionary processes include the following, natural selection, okay, natural selection, which was also proposed by Wallace and Darwin, okay, gene flow, gene flow, genetic drift, genetic drift, and mutations, mutations, and of course it is mating, and we don't have non-random mating, and we have selective selective mating. It can also impact the the population and and cause it to evolve. So, how are these factors impacting population for populations to evolve? That's what evolution is about. All right, and unfortunately, it's having this bad taste because it's being put on a social platform, and this is not this is not what what should happen. All right. So, what is natural selection? What I was saying, if you have a population, so of organisms, of individuals or organisms that belong to the same species, all right, and that are living in the same area. And you say that, okay, you know what? Nothing about you guys matter than your nucleic acid, all right? Because that's what determines who you are, and that's what shows that you are you are of the same species. So we are going to take out all your chromosomal sets and throw them in in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a specific area. So let's say I take this this basket or something and and throw all the chromosomal sets and alloys. Of, of allows are alternative forms of genes, okay, and genes are made up of DNA, okay. So let's say I take these these um, the nucleic acid material in, in their allelic forms because each species differs from the other species based on what the chromosomes is like. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so we have and assume a specific uh, anatomical structure. Other organisms have this. This chromosomal set, so they have a different structure, and it's of course it's not just the chromosomal set, but it's also the DNA sequences and and the regulatory functions. All all the craziness that is concerned with nucleic acid activity is all playing a role in giving the different forms of species that we are. All right. So um, having said that, I, I want to just throw in alloys. We are looking at just the alloys alone, so I'm going to use different colors. In, in so doing, I want to include other colors to represent not just the DNA sequence, but also the instructions that come with it that would differ from uh, that would differ from um, cell to cell, and in the, although it it will belong to the same species. All right, okay. So that's what I want to um, portray here. So multicellular organisms like you and I. Um, and throw in allos, right? And throw in the separate allos together with the unique and heritable traits within these allos by showcasing it with separate colors, all right? So I'm going to throw in some green over here as well, okay? So I'll just use these three colors, green, black, and, and blue, okay? So we have, so let's say we have all of them over in these separate allos. And so we are saying that evolutionary, where we are now is looking at how evolutionary process is impacting the population to produce evolution. What does that mean? Let's start with natural selection, right? So with natural selection, basically what we are saying is that environmental conditions has occurred, okay? Like the Earth has faced a lot of uh, mass extensions, five mass extensions, which is hazardous environmental conditions that did not allow um, the survival of certain molecular forms in, in within a, a specific population. And so it caused the, let's say, all the green allels um, could not survive 
um, to, in, in, to, to allow as they house the molecular structure because their expression and their regulatory instruction to the molecular structure could not so sufficiently sustain that being, that molecular being, in other words, that organism. So um, this natural selection environmental condition impacted um, molecular organisms that had the green adults because the green adults for some reason did not have heritable traits that could allow the survival of, of these organisms. So it means that all organisms that have the green adults would die off because of this environmental effect and therefore at this point the evolutionary process that has occurred is a natural selection where at this point the population no longer is having um, the, the organisms with the green adults but now this new population is not just having organisms that are housing just the um, um, black adults and then the um, blue adults, all right, that's the example. Now, what about gene flow? Gene flow is when a population somehow has managed to, has managed to have immigration, okay, or emigration um, activity that has probably removed adults that may, most of the adults at this point you are having equal number of black adults and equal number of blue adults. But let's say that um, emigration occurred and removed 90% uh, of the adults. So at this point, most of the population will be full of black adults, which will hence give instructions that will let the molecular um, beings look different. And therefore, that is also a form of evolution. Or you, you may, another gene flow can introduce a different a completely um, different alloy within the pool, okay? A completely different alloy within the pool that will now, um, like this purple um, alloys in there, that will now cause the population to change from what it was before, okay? So that is gene flow that could influence um, populations to change. Genetic drift can produce, um, could be a bottleneck effect or fundus effect where um, there's an isolation that can occur with just maybe a, a, a purple one alone that will start its own population and at some point it will be very distinct from the, the, the previous um, common ancestry and resume its own. All mutations can occur within the allows themselves. The, some of the black allows um, have undergone mutation that will now have a different DNA thing that will look like this brown that I've introduced and that will also bring, bring a different um, molecular beings to be formed and hence a different um, uh, population depending on, on on how dominant they are or not, right? So these, these are all factors or evolutionary processes that can impact this population to bring about evolution. That's it. Do you see how simple this is? This is so simple, all right? So we, when we talk about evolution, these are examples of evolutionary processes that can impact populations for evolution to occur. So again, populations evolve, individuals do not evolve. So in any case, when you take a species from this population and you compare it to the species, from that population, okay, that had the green and then the uh, black chromosome sets, and it looks like this, right? You know, and then let's say so, and the, and but this organism is now extinct, right? Um, in the end, it, you isolated it from a population and extinct organism from this population, and then several years down the line, you have um, you, are, you are seeing these other living organisms that that are in this new population right now that looks like this and the kind of adults that they have are adults that look like let's say again the black adult is still present but this time the other adult 
um, of chromosome assets that are present is this one. What are you going to say? You're going to say that this one, okay, the extinct one, you're going to call the extinct one the common ancestor, okay, to this present one, okay. So the common ancestor of this one organism is this organism that you isolated from this population. Or you are going to say that this population, okay, um, serve as a common ancestor to this modern population. So that is how we communicate this information regarding evolution. Okay, populations evolve, individuals do not. Individuals modify with descent. Okay, that is all there is to evolution. And I hope this information goes far than just the classroom, all right?